Astonishing Legends would like to thank Blue Apron, Backblaze, Quip, The Great Courses Plus, and our supporters at Patreon for making tonight's show possible. Last week, we introduced you to the story of a haunting in Pontefract, England. A home there, at 30 East Drive, has been the location of what some have referred to as the most violent poltergeist ever recorded. So far, we've talked about the actions that this invisible force took, including throwing household objects at the residents of the property, the Pritchard family. It hurled small items like paintbrushes, and larger ones too, such as a mechanical carpet sweeper, which it spun violently around in the air. It even threw a mattress off of young Diane's bed several times, with her on it. But somehow she did not get hurt. At one point, it levitated furniture and used it to pin Diane down, with so much force that her mother Jean and teenage brother Philip couldn't pry the floating furniture off of her with all of their might. That is, until her mother convinced her to take a deep breath and just relax. Amazingly, in spite of all of this, it, whatever it is, never really hurt her. Up to that point, anyway. Tonight, we'll take you back there as we cover the ongoing events that continued to happen in the Pritchard home. This, our second part in the Black Monk of Pontefract, can be summed up with one word. Escalation. Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is Forrest Burgess. I shall not commit the fashionable stupidity of regarding everything I cannot explain as a fraud. Psychiatrist Dr. Carl Jung in a 1919 address to the Society for Psychical Research in England. Join us tonight for part two of our series on the Black Monk of Pontefract. Poltergeist? Oh, very good. Yeah, yeah, you picked up on that really quickly. Nice. People are really <laughs> digging all your character work, so we... I don't think so, but... Yeah, uh, no, I got, we have got an email, somebody, or a tweet, somebody said, for me to let you do your voices. Really? Well, yeah. I, del- I try to delete the other ones that say otherwise, so... <laughs> That's probably where I'd see in them. A couple of quick things tonight, folks. Last week, our editor, if you couldn't tell, the lovely and talented Sarah Wendell was out of town. So I had to cut the show myself. Mm. Uh, you know, before we hired her, I did that all the time. But the show was less complex back then. And I had a few hiccups when we posted part one of this series. One of them required me to actually delete the very first posting, like right after I posted it and announced it everywhere. So apologies if you're one of those folks that had downloading problems initially, because I know it freaked out CastBox and a few other apps. But anyway, uh. the slightly more humorous error, and I had to replace it again was a misplaced sound design cue that not only wasn't where it was supposed to be it was super loud this gave quite a few people heart attacks and for that i apologize Mm. i went back and fixed it and replaced the audio file again for the posting but seventy thousand people had already downloaded it and i would just like to say sorry if your eardrums were blown out by that one (laughs) Um, just know our sound design will remain as it's been for quite some time now and while we're not above a jump scare it won't be so freaking loud Uh, by the way You may not have noticed, Forrest, I don't know if you did, but Mm. we went from mono to stereo on all our shows several months ago. We used to just do that in October, but it's a full-time thing now. Oh, uh, yes. No, I've heard that. You know, I can't help but feel partially responsible for that uh, sound cue flaw because I was supposed to QC the show, which I did on Bose earbuds, high quality. But you never heard it. Well, no, but also I was streaming the show through Dropbox, and that gets a little chunky sometimes. Yeah, yeah, skipped. Uh, We actually had... I mean, I love Dropbox, but it's not great for that. No, I I was telling Scott, it's like, I think it's pretty good. And then, of course, right after that, I heard a repeat line. It's like, ooh, you got a dangling piece of audio Oh, yeah, I left a line in there. It was where I had started to say something... And then I redid the take while we were recording, and I didn't catch it when I did the edit. So it was me starting to talk. So it was me starting to So it was like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I, I played back a couple of times, and it did it until like the last time. It's yeah. like, oh, it didn't do it this last time. Anyway, it was confusing. We apologize, but I didn't hear it. Uh, I wish I would have jumped. <laughs> I would have enjoyed it more. Anyway, yes, it's in stereo now, so that should add to the spooky good uh, oral experience. Yeah, the files are a little bit bigger, but nobody seems to care about that much anymore. So. Yeah, so uh, what's up for the big Halloween uh, announcement here. Oh, yeah. A lot of people have been asking about those. The Halloween hoodies that we're making, they're being printed next week. 
a bunch of people are wanting to know when those are going to be in the store. By the time part three of this series drops, they should be there. Meaning by the weekend of September 21st, 2018, give or take a couple of days to get them in there and get the, you know, a photo taken and get them into the inventory. But they will be there sometime that weekend. Also, as I just said, this series is going to three parts. I think I said last week's show was part one of two in the opening. I lied. (laughs) <laughs> it's taken three years to train you not to paint us into a corner. Yes. So, like, yeah. That's like, the thing. I try to be open-ended I know, now. now you yeah. do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, rather than like, oh, you know, crud, now we got to actually do what Scott said. So uh, we're keeping an open book. Uh, we think we have a, enough good material here for a really good wrap-up. Yes. And analysis. So, yeah. Yeah, that's in the works for part three. Yeah, part three will be more uh, contemporary investigations, including some very recent stuff that happened, and uh, talking about all the theories and analysis about what's actually happening in this house. Oh, by the way, the word I was looking for last week regarding the vicar saying the house was settling when the yeah, first candlestick yeah. fell off the mantle is subsidence. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, so my brother-in-law, Dr. Timothy Moore, actually texted me to tell me that when he heard the show. I was too lazy to look it up last week. <laughs> well, but, well, that was <laughs> like me uh, regarding uh, paranormal versus supernatural. Supernatural, yes. And then it's like, ah, geez, I can't remember what that is. And then it popped into my head, like, it's kind of like this. Anyway, I'm glad Rich Haddam had a laugh. Yeah, he he (laughs) approved. Uh, Okay. (laughs) Anyway, uh, subsidence, this is what Dr. Tim, uh, my brother-in-law, said about subsidence. He lived in Great Britain. He and uh, my sister-in-law both lived in Great Britain for quite some time. So he said, uh, quote, house television shows in the UK are obsessed with finding out the house has (laughs) subsidence. It is very common for a house to have subsidence, especially given the large number of ancient mines that run under towns. Oh, interesting. You know what? That reminded me, I was kind of thinking this when we went over the story. I didn't want to stop us down to check, and and I didn't do that now either. But it reminded me of a scene from a Dickens novel, and I think I was watching this because uh, uh, I'd heard the story before, but I was watching the fantastic Claire Foy in Little Dorrit, and she's amazing. It's the first time I've ever seen her or anything. Like, wow, I don't know who this is, but she's going places. And as we've seen, uh, she's playing the queen now and more. But in one scene, and I again, I apologize if this is wrong, but in one scene, a whole house collapses. Oh, yeah. And I think at that time, it's like, what? Does that, <laughs> boy, that's a dramatic story turn there. And I think I actually looked it up, and that's a real, you know, around that time, I guess that would be 1840s or so, that was a possibility due to shoddy construction and just subsidence. Yeah. Houses settling and people's whole houses just suddenly collapsing. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess the vicar was making a good point when the candlestick fell off the mantle, but then, of course, the second one floated off the mantle in front of his face yes. and then dropped on the floor. Right. At it, which it point she was like, <laughs> subsidence? Yeah. No, but th- that's <laughs> that was the point we were trying to make in setting up and describing the character of this entity in that it's not like these things are just randomly happening. Things are just flying around willy-nilly. It hears you. It's listening to you. And it can anticipate what you're going to do and what you're thinking somehow. And like with the vicar, it's making fun of him, as it did with Aunt Maud. It's like, oh, falling down, eh? Gravity, you say? Let me just defy the laws of gravity and float this in front of your face. Now what do you say? Yeah. It's playing with you and has been for the whole time, except that it's a very capricious spirit. Let's talk a little bit more about Aunt Ma, because when we left off last week, she was fairly freaked out. And rightfully so. Yes. And what I want to say was that, you know, again, for parts one and two of this series, we are sharing information we learned of in the late Colin Wilson's book, Poltergeist, A Classic Study in Destructive Hauntings. That came out back in 1993. We had the Kindle edition of that book. So Aunt Maude, Maude Pierce, she was Joe Pritchard's sister, the dad of the family, had come to see Fred, one of two pet names for the disturbance at 30 East Drive, Mm -hmm. because she didn't believe it was real, and also she thought it was the kids. So that was, however, before the gloves she wore to the house vanished and then appeared not once but twice floating around the house and even making fun of her by conducting her as she sang Onward Christian Soldiers (laughs) in in an effort to, like, defeat this thing. In a very Bugs Bunny way, I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, for me, there's a lot of Bell Witch-type stuff happening here. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll get into that later. But listen to this small passage from Wilson's book about the fate of those gloves. This is uh, from Kindle Location 1952 in his book Poltergeist. None of them had much sleep that night when Aunt Maud left the next morning saying that she wouldn't stay there again for 20,000 pounds. Her gloves were nowhere to be seen. Jean Pritchard later found them in the bottom of the cupboard. She returned them to Aunt Maud, but Aunt Maud refused to touch them. She carried them into the garden with coal tongs and burned them with paraffin on the rubbish heap. So she took them, she took tongs, carried them out back, 
and set them on fire. I know that that might be seen as a ridiculous overreaction, but if you believe in some kind of transference or uh, bad, it's funny. It's bad almost mojo. a yeah. Well, yeah, it's a uh, or juju. Whatever the more modern thinking of this, and those who study spirit energy and all that will say, like maybe if you touch something that's been enchanted in a way or is a haunted object, it could transfer to you a little, and. So I, I think with Aunt Ma, she just thinks these things are dirty and of the devil, so she's not going to touch them with her hands. But maybe it's a good idea to grab these things with tongs. Who knows? It, yeah. you know, I mean, again, that's an overreaction, but it's just I funny. Don't, I, I don't know what I would way. do with a pair of gloves that seem to have ghost hands in them that, <laughs> that made fun of me, no less. Well, I, uh, exactly. I mean, <laughs> for myself, I'd probably just go on wearing them because they sound expensive. And, uh, you know, if you like them, to keep them around rather than just burn them, I'm... Some people do that. They just would rather get rid of it. I would just kind of monitor them and see how I felt about them. So that was just the beginning of what was going to be nine months of pretty insane activity in the house at 30 East Drive. So just to refresh everyone where we're at now, it was 1966 when the first round of stuff happened that we talked about in part one. Then nothing happened for two years. So now it's 1968 and this stuff is starting to ramp up again and go on for, like I said, nine months. We're about to share with you all of that additional stuff that happened, all of it triggered by Jean, the mother of the house, wanting to fix up her daughter Diane's room. That's when it started right. with that craziness. So Jean remembers that she has a friend that calls herself psychic. This woman is named uh, Renee Holden, and she comes over to start kind of observing things and try to see what's going on and get a feeling for things. And she starts to see all kinds of stuff. She's there. She's an eyewitness for a lot of things that happen. And one of the things that she particularly noted, which I thought we could talk about a little bit, Forrest, was that when activities were going on, the kids seemed kind of knotted up, right. real tense. And she speculated that it had something to do with energy kind of draining from their solar plexus. Right. Which is a chakra point, right? Which is... Yeah, that's actually what popped in my head first was that <laughs> I'm not an expert on this. I've heard, uh, you know, I've read a little bit about chakras, certainly people we know and are friends with are much more knowledgeable and uh, have uh, do Reiki and, and some other uh, techniques to work with this uh, type of energy. But that's the first thing I thought. It's like, I think there's a chakra center there. And so we looked it up and the solar plexus chakra, I believe is called the Manipura. A quick brief summary from the website chakras.info characterizes the Manipura as radiate your power in the world, could say the solar plexus chakra. Characterized by the expression of will, personal power, and mental abilities, the energy of the third chakra, or Manipura, in Sanskrit, is mobilized when we assert ourselves in the world. Discover its key characteristics and how to make the most of this powerful energy center. So a couple of those words jumped out at me in that brief description here, though, which is just meant to familiarize yourself with the solar plexus chakra, uh, mental abilities, and personal power, will, those things seem to connect to a poltergeist, even if the person, uh, you know, it's, we talked about this in part one, a lot of times young people are associated with these types of uh, kinetic experiences, you could say, and events. And that was curious that when she said to just calm down, relax, and she did, and who knows, maybe it seemed what happened there could have been coincidence one, you have to believe that kinetic events are happening to begin with. Yeah. Secondly, that uh, <laughs> this had some kind of effect on it. If you believe or, any of this or, at all. Or it's yeah. like, well, you know what? I believe the poltergeist stuff. I don't believe that it has any connection to the... Yeah, you're picking and choosing. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, right. Logic the, beliefs. The, the chakra tensing up, and, and that's partly connected to this crazy, uh, you know, violent experience here. Okay, so if it wasn't a coincidence, then it seemed to have some effect. But that's what I thought about. It's like the tense energy. Well, you know this from martial arts. I studied it as a kid. Yeah. It's key, which is, I believe, lower. That energy center is lower, maybe a, a little bit below your navel, but probably another, I guess, I'm you know, not a chakra expert, but probably another one. I know you do have one down there. There's like seven, I think. But yeah. that also has to do with focusing your inner powers. I've been told it's like when a tiger tenses up before it's about to pounce. You capture that. And then uh, you keep, uh, which is the yell, the battle yeah. cry. Yeah, yeah. before you attack. That's the release of that energy. 
So a lot of cultures believe this, the least likely, probably us, uh, you know, highfalutin Westerners here. But there seems to be something with this young person, their energy, and maybe this thing is, and if you go down that route, this thing is feeding off of that energy, the fear energy, the tensing up. It being young people, it, it being able to harvest that uh, energy and use it. Well, it speaks to, you know, the moment when we, again, when we talked about in part one about the furniture that was pinning Diane down. Yeah. And I don't know what made her mom think this. It may have been just motherly intuition, but it may have also been a connection with what was going on and with this thing. When she just told Diane, she was like, you've got to relax, like yeah. take a deep breath and just relax. And when she did... Yeah they were able to get the furniture off of her. Yeah. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's very fascinating. So Well, that's always a mother's, you know, instinct, and it helps in any situation. Remember, it always, it's kind of a cute scene, but it's in a Christmas story, and, and Ralphie, uh, he gets hit in the face with a snowball, and he's crying, and he's very upset, and she's just like, calm down, yeah. calm down. And it's just, it's just a soothing thing, but mothers know to do that. Which, well, and uh, also Walter White. I remember in Breaking oh, Bad, one of my favorite lines, <laughs> right. yeah. the baby's crying and he picks it up and he's holding it right like right after he's killed three people or something. <laughs> and he's like, or affected the and uh, he says, killing of people. I am a calming presence. <laughs> <laughs> and he is. Yeah. <laughs> that was it, my favorite line, I think, in the whole series. Yeah, I was like, that yeah. is great. That's uh, all part of your personal energy. And if you go the Eastern route with martial arts, uh, a friend of mine, John, he uh, took a few Tai Chi classes and uh, he's a Caucasian guy who teaches English in Japan and has for many years now. But one time he said he met a Tai Chi master, like the Japanese people revered this guy. He was probably in his 80s. And he said, uh, before I was introduced, I felt this like really benevolent power coming off of this guy, just radiating peace and harmony, but also personal power. I mean, he literally took note of this guy, like, who is this older gentleman? And they go like, oh, well, he's a Tai Chi master. Yeah. And it's like, it was, whoa, you he's got the, you the feel key. It. You could feel the key yeah. coming out of him that he was just, again, before John uh, knew who this older guy was, we certainly see uh, senior citizens all the time, but they don't usually bowl us over like that. So maybe there's something to it. But yeah, in this case, I do think that just heightened emotion in any case, and it doesn't matter uh, who's triggering all this uh, psychokinetic energy, if it's the young kids or it's this other presence feeding off of that or the presence itself, just the overall calming down in the room seemed to have some effect. Yeah. Well, and that's something that we've covered before in other episodes about sort of that calm feeling, something to remember. I guess it could be one of your first lines of defense if you ever find yourself, you know, in a situation like this, which we hope nobody who's listening to this show does, something that you want to avoid. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, but, me say, in a violent uh, criminal situation. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah, you yeah. try and calm, de-escalate. De-escalate. Rather than escalate. Yeah, you're negotiating. And yeah. you, you, there's nothing that says you can't negotiate with something from the other side. Yeah. It certainly doesn't make sense to aggravate it. Which you see on some of these ghost shows. Um, and well, I'm that's a... <laughs> like, why are you yelling? <laughs> no, they're throwing rocks at it and, and taunting it. And that's funny. You know, I, we've talked about this before at ghost shows. I, I will usually only watch one if it has some connection to what we're doing. So I actually I haven't seen that many at all. Uh, I don't have cable, but I will uh, maybe go check it out or watch it with Scott here. And we've seen pretty decent ones, but I have heard a lot of the sillier ones, I guess, where they're really just being feisty and taunting this thing. Because look, how often do you see, well, uh, something like what we've seen in the photo that we listed for our website here from the good folks at uh, 30eastdrive.com. That one photo's blew people away on Twitter. Just, it, it's so creepy and nobody, it's such a weird thing. Yeah. And we'll talk about the analysis of that photo in part three, but you don't usually get evidence that good on one of these go shows, That's as true. far as I know. Yeah. It's certainly nothing on video. So they're taunting things. They're trying to get some movement, like, hey, did you hear that? You know, and it's done for entertainment purposes, and it's done for excitement. But what's interesting, I think, as we've gone on our journey in this and meeting more people who do paranormal investigations, we have heard of people who will try and taunt the situation, try and increase this to try and get something, and sometimes it has negative effects on them. Yeah. It's not a good idea. That should definitely be part of the frap. <laughs> or, Don't you know, cause a frap. You know, somebody came up with yeah. uh, forest, r- forest rules about the paranormal. Yes, Although someone funny. online on Facebook, I can't remember which listener it was, listed a bunch of other potential mm. acronyms for mm-hmm. your rules. And mm-hmm. the, I got to admit, there was one I liked. It was frost. <laughs> 
<laughs> forest was, rules. Now I can't remember what it was, but yes, it, was, it was, was good. That was a good of, one. Uh, yeah, something special. Uh, yes, yeah. it was pretty good. There was a bunch of them. They were, they were all funny. But the funny thing about that one was that by junior high, a football coach, that's what he, that was his nickname. Frosty. Oh, Frosty. Yeah, there you oh, go. Okay. A little, uh, <laughs> There we no go. one needed to know that, but that's no. the tie in there. But it was just kind of, it made me think of that, you know. And the return yeah. of a tangent. Hey, did you see that Blue Apron has brought back some Whole30 meals for September? I did. And I think that partnership with Whole30 a while back was really popular. So I'm glad I returned. And last week, I tried the crispy chicken tenders with mashed potatoes, with butter lettuce salad and ranch dressing. And it was a delish dish. Oh, so are you trying out the Whole30 program then? No, I, I just like the meals. Oh, that figures. <laughs> I think they're just as tasty as everything else you can get that's designed by the pro chefs at Blue Apron. So if it helps with your goals, so much the better. And it's a recipe you can make in 35 minutes. Oh, that's another thing I wanted to mention. Blue Apron now has meals you can make in 20 minutes or less, which really helps me out when I got to pick up the kid from school, take him to karate, then make dinner on top of that and get back out here in the studio so we can record. Yeah, they have a bunch of fast and easy recipes now you can choose from that really gets you to the dinner table quicker while not sacrificing any flavor. You just look for the cook times listed in green on the Blue Apron website or on their app. I just made the spicy lime chicken and noodles with green beans and fritikake and it was quick and super tasty. Yeah. Yeah, go see and taste what we're talking about. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free at blueapron.com slash astonishing. That's blueapron.com slash astonishing to get your first three meals free. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Hello, everyone. I'm Mari, and this is Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. All right, so okay. let's get back to Renee Holden, the psychic, who yeah. was Jean's friend. She comes over to the house. She was there. She witnessed a whole lot of stuff. But one of the most fascinating, this is one of my favorite details of the events that happened at the house, was she was over there. They were downstairs. Jean was downstairs, and Renee Holden was downstairs, her, her psychic friend. And they had a big tray of food they were getting ready mm -hmm. to eat, which I think they were bringing from the kitchen to what they call the lounge, which I'm going to say for us in America is probably the living room. Living room, yeah. parlor, could be, you know, it's a, the entertainment room. Yeah. We, the, we gather in, people around. The yeah. entertainment room. Yeah. Coming in there, the lights turn out like they always do. I want to tell everyone, by the way, because I don't know if we've mentioned this yet, the power for the lights, the switch, is in a cabinet under the stairs. It yes. is closed. Right. With fuses, the yeah. old fashioned fuses. Yes. Yeah. So you can go in there and you, and they actually got to a point where they were taping it on. We'll talk about that in a second. But the power would go out. They would have to go under there and turn them back on manually by opening this cabinet under stairs. So the lights go out and then there's this huge crashing sound. The, the tray of food just goes up in the air or whatever. So then the lights go out. There's a huge crash. By the way, get ready because there's a crashing sound effect. <laughs> for those of you driving. <laughs> yeah, for yeah. those of you driving. There's a huge crash. They scramble around, they go over to the cupboard, they open the cupboard up, they turn the lights back on, they turn the power back on at the main switch, and they're cleaning up, which is what poor Jean seems to always have to be doing, is cleaning up after this absurdly rude poltergeist. <laughs> right. And Renee goes over behind the television. Mm -hmm. I think it was Renee, it might have been Jean, but either way, one of them finds the sandwich that was on the tray, and it's down on the floor behind the television. She picks it up, and it's got a huge bite taken out. <laughs> Yeah. A bite. So in that moment that the stuff got flung up and sent across the room, something somehow took a bite out of that sandwich. Well, uh, <laughs> I think what we can assume here is that it wasn't hungry per se. No. It's another gag. It's another joke. It's, yeah, it's that, so uh, mischievous. It's the jokester in the school cafeteria who comes up and puts his thumbprint in your sandwich. But this is my question. Because there's been a lot of speculation, and again, this is a, more of a theoretical discussion for part three, but if this is just psychokinetic energy or something that's manifesting that's not really an entity, then what took the bite out of the sandwich? From the feedback we've gotten just from our friends here who do these kind of investigations is that it seems those that are more intuitive, shall I say, get a sense that there's multiple things going on here. It's yeah. not one person. There's a bunch of different things, so... Are they working in concert? Are they battling it out here? All I can tell you from this action is that it's a joke. It's a pr it's a prank. I want to know where the bite went because I don't think it got chewed up like a ghost. <laughs> And you think they, I feel like they would have mentioned it if they found and it. And processed and excreted. It's probably somewhere out in the garden. Who knows? 
or but another dimension. It could be in another interdimensional chamber pot or bam pot. But the point is that wherever that bite is, it's not about the bite taken out of it. It's not about hunger. It's about you finding the sandwich later and like, ha ha, I took a bite out of your sandwich. Yeah. Fools. That's the point of that. This story, this particular event, this is really fascinating to me. And there's a lot to unpack here, which, by the way, I feel like unpack is making me around <laughs> in the is zeitgeist it, of this country right that now. And, yeah. and blank goal. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. anyway. Podcast goals. <laughs> right. Summer goals. Christmas goals. I know. Pumpkin spice goals. Well, yeah. So the idea here, though, I think with this one is that it gives you a lot of insight. If you're really curious, like I am, and, and Scott here as well, about how these things are happening, what is happening... To me, this is in the league of stanchion number four at Skinwalker Ranch and the camera going missing. Certainly, there's been a ton of pranks. But, you know, I mean, we were joking about this before. It's like, I said, like, well, it kind of tells you what happened. He's like, it didn't tell you anything about what happened because it was instantaneous. Yeah. It just disappeared and the cables like they were ripped out, like somebody actually physically did them. But it was in an instant. And I said, well, that's a clue right there that these things happen in an instant. You don't see them. Well, it's a manipulation of time and possibly space. E exactly. So that's why this is one of my favorites here. Well, this is what Colin Wilson calls in his book, the interpenetration of matter, which I thought was a really good label for it. And this is what happens. They're sitting in the lounge in the house again. This is where a lot of things happen. See, most stuff takes place either in the kitchen or the lounge, although some stuff is taking place, especially with regard to Diane, near the stairs, going up the stairs and upstairs, the upstairs part of the house. But in this case, they're in the living room and they're sitting there and I guess this egg just floats into the room. I and mean, this is straight out of Poltergeist, so pretty amazing. So yeah. it floats into the room, then it stops, then it falls on the floor and breaks open. Right. At that point, Jean, the mom, Jean Pritchard, smells a really strong perfume smell, mm -hmm. which she's come to associate with Fred, in yeah. air quotes, showing up. A very strong perfumey smell. But what's interesting to me here is that Colin says in his book that Philip found the it was a different odor. It was something oppressive to him. So I don't, was I'm not convinced much. they were smelling the same thing, yeah. which I think is super interesting. It tells you a little bit about sensory manipulation. I had a little bit of that. We'll talk about in our Halloween extravaganza where I think the only thing that was weird to me is I smelled something stronger than I think everyone else did. But it wasn't a big deal. Here, I think what's happening is that how I read this is that Philip, it's kind of like that sickeningly sweet perfume some of the older generation might wear. Oh, you know yeah. what I'm talking about. Yes. Great yeah. and so and so. <laughs> and it's like, my apologies if you wear this, but White Shoulders, I think, was a. Oh, scent. really? That was the name of one. And it's like, no, I mean, I come to, to like it because I, you know, I love my great aunt, but I think that was the perfume. <laughs> so she, when you get, is she listening? No, no, she's passed. But okay. When, what okay. I'm saying is when you so go she to. She can still be listening. <laughs> uh, that is true. I mean, she was had a great sense of humor. She would yeah. laugh at this. But, you know, when you go to hug her and she gives you a kiss, you smell like that for the next 30 minutes at yeah, least. You know, yeah. so I think what Philip is saying is that it's floral, but it's too much. It's like too much. It's, it's cranked up. So to your point, how we perceive the stimuli that this thing's given off could be different. To Gene, it's very pleasant. So this egg floats into the room. It stops, falls on the floor, crashing open. Then another egg comes into the room and does the same thing. At this point, Jean, who is now kind of tired of dealing with this thing. Well, no, she's very house proud and, yes. a, and a mess is not allowed. Yeah. So she, <laughs> it's constantly a mess. Done, Thank done. you. Yeah. So she gets up, she goes into the kitchen, she opens the refrigerator, pulls out the eggs yeah. and sees that some are missing. Yeah. So she's like, uh-uh, these are my <laughs> eggs. So she takes them and there's a wooden box in there, I guess, some kind of wooden crate thing yes. on the floor. She puts the eggs inside the box I think the lid opens from the top. And yeah, she it's like one of those uh, farm boxes you see at an antique store right. or something. Yeah. So she puts the eggs in there and sits on it. Yeah. And you she's would, like, yeah. you're not going to take these eggs. Yeah, these are my eggs. So I'm going to have them for breakfast. Well, it's, it's, well, one, yeah, you don't want to waste your eggs. Secondly, I think she's to the point now, like you said, when people get used to it, they get so tired of it. It's like, okay, let's see what you do now, smart guy. Right. Uh, see if you can get these eggs out of this box as I sit on it. Right. So she sits down on it and somehow another egg appears, just appears in front of her, goes into the living room, drops on the floor. It happens again and again and again until they are all gone. She never gets off the box. Yeah. This is interpenetration of matter. Yeah. After they are done, she gets up, opens the box, looks in there, the eggs are all gone. Yeah. Those were her eggs. Yeah. So what's happening there? How is this 
thing capable of doing this. It's levitating things and it's moving solid objects through other solid objects. All right, we bring this up all the time, but there's one, you know, we always talk about Paranormal Witness, which is such a great show. I don't think they're still yeah. producing it, but, or actually maybe they are, and I feel like I watched the newer ones. They brought now. it back or something. I didn't enjoy it's it a, as it's much. It's a British but, production, but season one was pretty good. Unbelievable. And the second season was as well. And then- um, The Ouija board in the kiddie pool. Yeah. Being held down. Yeah. By the Native American shaman. And yeah. That was, that was a spectacular episode. Yeah, there's been a lot of good stuff on there, but yeah. one of the things that we always talk about, and we've brought this up in multiple episodes, actually, is that whatever the case, I can't even remember the original case. I think you mentioned it in as recently as part one of the series where yes. the angry dad like throws the ceramic kitty cat it out is the a, back door, out the sliding glass yeah. door, way out into the backyard. Right. And they turn around and it's sitting right there where he picked it up from. Yeah, you hear that all the time. Again, that was... Uh, and, I mean, that's not interpenetration of matter, but it demonstrates a command of time and space that does not make sense to you. You're humanity. able to... Uh, yeah, I talked about this in part one where you're able to... This thing is able to transmute matter, I guess, or teleport it, teleport well, and, the matter. And this yeah. leads to my biggest question about these types of events. And it's like the thing with the eggs. Mm -hmm. I think about, and I know I've mentioned this on the show before too, there was an old, I don't can't remember if it was the Twilight Zone or the Outer Limits, but there yeah. was the episode where the guy, he's living in a different time registry. So he's yeah. going super, super fast. So what oh, it yes. seems like to him is that everything is frozen. Are you talking about the astronauts that land on Yeah, it's like an astronaut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everyone yeah. looks uh, perfectly still, and then they kind of figure out, like, wait, are No, they're we... moving, but it's so slow. Like, and there's a little girl well, on a tricycle yeah. in front of a tractor right. trailer. Right. And he opens the door on the tractor trailer and uses, like, the seatbelt to steer it away or whatever. Yeah. What that is, for the people who are living in normal time, they don't know, and they did this on Star Trek, too. I think it was in, <laughs> on The Next yeah. Generation. They uh -huh. had one of these where right. they were in different times. It's very fascinating. But anyway... This is what I'm wondering. With regard to the eggs, are the eggs being manipulated or are the people being manipulated? And with regard to the ceramic kitty cat, yeah. is the kitty cat being manipulated or are the people being manipulated? Is there something there that's moving so fast it can't be seen? Right. Or is something controlling the experiencer's perception by freezing them in time? Yeah. I can't figure out which side of the equation is being messed with. Is it the people? Yeah. Or is it the other side? Are the right. people just living their normal lives and it seems miraculous because this whatever's on the other side has this unbelievable power to do all this stuff, like you said, the pole at Skinwalker Ranch or the ceramic mm -hmm. kitty cat, or in this case, these eggs, which were not only transmuted, they came out of a wooden box without yeah. the box being opened, and then they floated and they all got destroyed. So it's, and then there's the yeah. smell of the perfume, which right. is, I, what, These are all what very is going common. on? You know, one of the good things about this story is that you're getting a lot of this stuff happening within one story. Within one location, you're getting a lot of classic ghosty kind of stuff. Interpenetration of matter. I've heard this quite a bit, actually from friends of mine, who uh, one guy knew I was working on a, uh, uh, I was editing a um, independent film he'd made. And it wasn't the film we were working on, but I believe he said he shot one in, it was an old house they could get to rent, and, and they found out later it was haunted. They didn't go there because of that. Just weird stuff was happening. You know, things would go missing and show up in different places. They're trying to work there. I believe he was sleeping at the house. He was staying there, but he got a glass of ice water. He's going to bed. He walks up the stairs, and it's the really old staircase with the banister, the really thick one, with the big, heavy newel posts with the top flats on them. And he sets the glass down, and uh, I think he's checking his phone or something, and he turns around, and now the glass is at the bottom of the stairs on the newel post, the flat part of it, all the way down the stairs. And he's like, what the heck? You know, because yeah. he just set it down, and he's like, okay, maybe I blanked out. And he looks at the top of the newel post where he's standing at the top of the stairs, and he can see the water ring it left. Right. It's still and see, there. And there's things like this, too, in the house at 30 East Drive, because during one of the, I can't remember which event it was, but during one, of the, I think we glossed over this because there's so much to share. But during one of the events, the light, when the lights came back on, they were only out a few minutes. All right. the chairs in the room were upside down. That's very dramatic. I think, uh, I don't know, to me, it seems like it takes a lot of energy to do that. So in season one episode three with the poltergeist of and uh, paranormal witness yeah, paranormal witness and also i think it's called slash being watched in the woods about a bigfoot and a patrolman the idea though is that this thing's very powerful because it does a lot of things that most demonologists would say 
regular human spirits cannot do. They don't possess that amount of power. <laughs> As Rob Christofferson was joking, human ghosts are very crappy. It's trying to strangle you. Yeah. <laughs> There's not a lot. They would if they could. There's not that much power. This thing in that episode, that's what freaked me out, is that it could start fires. Yeah. Uh, they come in the hallway. And here's the thing. It's not part of the rules. It didn't just burn the house down with everybody in it. It may not have been allowed to do that. We, and we don't know. How would we know if that ever happened? You wouldn't. All I can say with this family is that they come in the hallway, according to them, and there'd be like a pan from the kitchen and like some, I believe it was like toilet paper wadded up. It'd be on fire and it set off the alarm. And like, who, who did this? It's like, well, none of the, the two girls didn't. So it was this woman's daughter and her friend that was staying there. And then I think the woman's, it was either her boyfriend or the stepdad. But he was in disbelief, and that's the scene that you talk about where they tried to appease this thing, whatever it was. They realize they're dealing with, dealing with something spiritual, and uh, they light some candles and say this little offering of prayer or whatever with this little ceramic white cat, right? which was a bad idea because you don't know what you're dealing with and you don't know what you're doing. And of course, the, the stepdad comes in and he gets furious. It's like, stop this. Because one, he doesn't believe it, but also... <laughs> He doesn't want to have to believe it. Yeah. He opens the back door and he chucks the thing out. They turn around, boom, it's right back on the counter. So something about this is able to do that. But you see that all the time. That's in the, the Changeling with George E. Scott. Yeah. The ball keeps bouncing down the stairs. So he this is in Seattle. He takes it and he, I think he's on the I-5 bridge. He just throws it into the water. They come back and it's right there. Yeah. So you hear about these kind of things all the time. And the scents, the delightful scent. Sometimes people say that they'll smell the scent of roses. And sometimes that's attributed to the Virgin Mary. Well, it reminds me of what my friend Mark Brignoni experienced at that hotel in Norway yeah, exactly. in the episode, The Flirting Ghost of Norway. He would smell like this perfume. Yeah. And it was, for him, he thought that there was a female spirit in the hotel room. With yeah, him. it could be uh, whatever they were in life. You hear that a lot too. It's like uh, well, uh, and, grandma and, was a chain smoker. Yeah. And when we think she's around, we smell cigarettes. Well, and, and the same thing with Merle at the Kent stage. Merle loved you, black he, coffee. Yeah, and you, if you sit over in the seats where he used to sit, you sometimes will get the smell of coffee. And it's not there all the time. It's yeah. not like spilled coffee. No. It comes and goes. <laughs> you know, it's fresh, hot, black, strong, dark roast Dark coffee. roast, which coffee. a lot of people were like, I didn't hear that. Well, uh, yeah, We're not but, done with the EVPs, <laughs> by the way. Uh, not you, by a sight. No, but you need to smell it while you're hearing it. And who knows how these mechanics work, but I, I just find it fascinating because, again, we, we see and we hear with our brains... So maybe something's hacking us. Are you backing your computer up regularly here? Well, probably not as often as I should. It's kind of a hassle because you got to hook it up to a hard drive and then leave it sitting around for a while. Well, honestly, cloud backup services are looking better and better for me personally. Well, you know, I've been looking at cloud backup services for over a year, but they all seem like really expensive, you know, pricey and too complicated, which is why I was pretty excited about our new sponsor, Backblaze. Oh, so you installed the software. I totally did. They actually let us try it out for free and I love it so much. I just became a paid member today. Yeah. It installed in just a few minutes, and frankly, it just started working. I mean, it was backing up before I even really knew what was going on, which I thought was kind of awesome, because what I want is low maintenance. Wow. Well, you know, I always worry about stuff in the cloud getting hacked, because yeah. uh, that happens a lot these days. Plus, how much does this cost? You're not going to believe this, man, but it's only five bucks a month. No. Oh. And Backblaze uses military-level encryption. Even if someone somehow managed to intercept your backup, they'd never be able to open it. Well, honestly, that does sound pretty good. Okay, so how does the recovery process work if you do need it? Well, you can recover your files from anywhere in the world you can get online. It works on both Macs and PCs, and they even have iOS and Android apps that allow you to get to any part of your data whenever you want on your smartphone. They even offer a mail restore program, too, where they'll send you a flash key or a hard drive with your data on it right to your door. With the backup software I have now, everything is bundled and compressed, so you, you can't really drill down on anything. Yeah, this is another great feature of Backblaze. You can pop into your backup and recover an individual file or folder even from your Apple or Android smartphone. They're actually helping people recover an average of over 1 million files an hour. I'm going to be moving my whole family over to it this weekend. All right, folks. Well, Scott here has walked the walk, and he wants me to talk the talk here. So check out Backblaze for yourself at backblaze.com slash legends for a fully featured 15-day free trial. But please make sure you use our custom URL so they'll know that you heard about them on our show. That URL again is backblaze.com slash legends. 
backblaze.com slash legends. Check it out today. You're listening to the Astonishing Legends podcast. Recommended to you, Andrew Anker, by me, Luke Crothers. Now let's get back to the show. Here's something that's interesting. This is a little aside. This isn't really a story. Mm. One night when they got up the next day and a bunch of the door handles in the on the first floor, I believe, mm-hmm. had been smeared with jam. <laughs> yeah, right. And yeah, then they had that, yeah. toilet paper attached to them. Oh, dear. And then at the bottom of the stairs, where everything seems to happen on the stairs, there was like some kind of mixture of marmalade and mustard. <laughs> Now, this is like Jean's worst nightmare, right? Because she's, like you said, a mess is not allowed. <laughs> right. uh, but the, yeah. again, that reminds me uh, of that other paranormal witness episode, right? Mm. Where the people, and I've read about this before, where the food is being used in particularly creative and messy ways. Uh, well, one, demons love toilet paper. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, and messing up your house with it. But that's also from season one, episode three. Oh, it's that same? Yeah. Okay, okay. I mean, that's paranormal, why... That's, that's paranormal witness. Yeah, yeah, that's why that one episode blows me away. I remember so much about it. I'm just talking off the cuff here, I actually. I hadn't watched it in a couple of years, I think. But yeah. it made such an impact on me because, you know, the testimony of the mother and the two girls that were living there, that they're terrified. You know, it's that feeling I got from the sludge entity and John's wife. It's like, you feel it. They're so scared. And so they're on camera and they're just, they're really shaken up and they're relaying these incidents. And also, it's one of the most dramatic things I've ever seen. Plus, they took photographs of this. And what you're talking about, why food, as you, or you say here in our outline, why the food vandalism? Yeah. It's just messy. It's the messiest thing. It's not harmful in a way. It's not like the whole house is doused with gasoline and it's waiting for somebody to like drop a match or, you know, flick a cigarette or something. It's kind of benign. It's childish. It's prankish. And it's messy and it's meant to annoy you. It's meant to mess with you. And in this case, though, with uh, Paranormal Witness S1E3, this thing would empty the refrigerator all onto the floor of uh, the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And they'd find stuff like a whole box of Ritz had been glued to the wall with peanut butter smears in these intricate patterns, sometimes upside down crosses, all these swirly patterns. Upside down crosses. Yeah, that's, that's what it looked like here. to me. Yeah, just like these swirling paisley patterns, but then they'd end in like a little, it looked like to me, like upside down crosses and just these bizarre patterns all over the walls. And uh, it's having fun. It's like a really devilish smart kid or precocious prankish kid doing this stuff, just causing a lot of trouble. And again, it's just you have to clean it up. Or I guess you couldn't, and maybe that would defeat it. Well, and we come back to, and Colin even suggested this in his book, the idea that in a way, the same way that Diane was maybe triggering whatever was pinning her down with the furniture until she relaxed, Colin Wilson suggests in his book, Poltergeist, A Classic Study in Destructive Hauntings, published in 1993, one of the things that he says in there was that perhaps Jean herself was aggravating this thing. And now we're not taking a blame the victim thing here. I'm not, I'm not doing that. <laughs> no, but no. what he was saying was that it could have been feeding off her in the energy of her desire to have a clean, orderly house. Yeah, and just, right. It's, it's that's the frustration why, and the anger, yeah, uh, likes the that. petty anger. It, yeah, that's why it's toying with you. It's like, why little kids in the back seat? Why is the one brother poking the other one? It's like, quit it, quit it. It's like, don't touch, I'm not touching you. Yeah. Because they get a kick out of that kind of annoyance of annoying another person and being a pest. Yeah. That's pretty fascinating to me. There was a point at which they actually tried, well, they reached out to the clergy and they wanted to get an exorcism. Now, we'll remind you that their friend O'Donnell had told them, you can't exercise a poltergeist. You can exercise a ghost, you know, a possession. But was that the vicar? Who told him that? It was their friend, O'Donnell. But so here's what the vicar did say, though, is like, you don't have to have one of us come in there. First of all, they wouldn't. Right. But secondly... He was like, well, you can do an amateur exorcism. So (laughs) they get Vic. DIY. Yeah. And so I want to remind you guys who Vic is. When the first incidents were happening and they were going across the street to Marie Kelly's house, Marie is Jean's other daughter and the sister of Jean Pritchard. Marie's husband is Vic. So Vic decides he's going to do an amateur exorcism in this house. Now, this is the same guy that originally called the cops to see if there were intruders. Now, he's come full circle. He's like, we're going to do an exorcism. So he goes in there. (laughs) 
and proceeds to do a very hackish sort of exorcism, and it's a complete disaster. Well, I don't know the equality. No, well, I read it. I'm telling you, I read it, and, the, and well, Colin yeah. agrees with it. I'm not going to yeah. describe the okay. whole thing here. We don't have right. time for it. No, I know, it, but, but he, like, well, he I did guess not know point. what he was doing. Not to be, yes, not yeah. to be uh, silly here, but was it sincere? Where did he get his information? Well, I think he was sincere. He got it from his friend who was in the church, but right. still, it didn't work out. What happened was, because here's the other thing, if you can't exercise a poltergeist, it doesn't matter how good it is. Yeah if you believe any of this at all. Mm. After he finished this amateur exorcism, I guess water started raining down from the walls and oh. from the ceiling well, everywhere. And hey, that's another Paranormal Witness episode. I yeah, think it's the water, one. what's that one called? The water or something. That's uh, my favorite episode. Is it? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the Rain King. The, yeah. Water is yeah. flying sideways. They think it had to do with this young man's evil grandfather. Yeah. After he passed, he got more powerful. Well, that was the man's theory himself. But yeah, he was manipulating water. Yeah. He was actually yeah. doing it anyway. So the water's like raining down, and this is really crazy, but essentially it got ticked off. Whatever this thing was, it got mad. And so that night, the whole night, there was just insane clanging and clinking and clanging. It got really irritated. Right. This exorcism set it off, and that led to this whole chain of events that is coming up now. And by the way, I wanted to mention something here. Listen to this quote about what Jean would say when she knew something was about to happen. This is during the sounds after the exorcism. Yeah. Quote, at the same time, she experienced the familiar sensation in her solar plexus, the sinking feeling that seemed to indicate that something was about to happen. Now, here's something I want to say. We already talked about the solar plexus a little bit and the chakras mm -hmm. and all that. Personally, when I was at the Kent stage yeah, in the that's front right. basement, yep. I had a light feeling there, but it yeah. was enough that it made me want to leave that front basement. You mean in the basement, yes. Yes. Right, and right. Yeah, I was standing right there. You looked a little uh, pale. And, yeah, uh, a feeling came over me that I needed to leave that room. Right. And I talked about that during our Kent episodes. Yes. So I'm not going to go on about it here. But here's the other thing that I'll tell you with regard to the Halloween shows coming up for 2018. I had a feeling like that, and we're going to be talking about it during mm -hmm. our Halloween shows, that was 10 times or more worse than the feeling I had at the Kent stage. Mm -hmm. It was a physical feeling right on my solar plexus. Yeah. And not only that, one of our listeners who tends to come help us out when we're on the road in her neck of the country, mm -hmm. she had the exact same feeling. So we're going to be talking about that at Halloween. You guys got to get ready because that's going to be a crazy show. But yeah. anyway. Well, let me ask you this, though. It's uh... I know the feeling, though. That's the weird thing. <laughs> I read about this stuff, and yeah. I can't relate. I can relate exactly to what she's saying. Here. No, that's I my, know that feeling. Yes, and that's my point all along. I'm changing. People, uh, no, it's just because... I mean, from when we started this show, I would have said that was hooey. Yeah. I right. say that to but all now the... But I've, uh, I've had the feelings. So. Right, the people that, uh, if you don't... If you don't understand this, it's because you just haven't experienced it yet. Well put. And you can't. We can't describe that well enough. This story can't be spooky enough to freak you out, to believe it. It's something you're going to have to experience for yourself. And either, you know, some people are open to it. I mean, they want to believe and uh, it's like that it hasn't happened. But I always wonder about this. Like when you say like it got mad, why would it get mad? I can't understand that logic because if you were trying to do all this stuff, would it mock you like it did Aunt Maud? Well, why? Yeah, there's something particularly about religion that irritated well, it. Because wait until you hear the other stuff that's about to happen to right. these poor people after this exorcism yeah. that didn't work. So, so I, I wonder about this all the time with people who uh, who don't go there, quote unquote. If there wasn't a spiritual component to this, why would they care? So after the attempted exorcism, Fred, or Mr. Nobody, is ticked Fred, off. Formerly Fred Nobody. Yes, and a bunch of you guys wrote in to us and said, hey, is it possible your son read this book when I told that story about him? It is entirely possible because they read books at school all the time that I yeah. don't know about. He right. might have read Mr. Nobody, and that might be where he got it from. And and also, I guess, in England. and In the UK, and yeah. in the UK in a general. A common phrase. It's a common phrase for kids who are trying to shift the blame. Or, <laughs> or anyone, you know, adults. Who did it? Yeah. yeah. Who Mr. Took Nobody. A, who took a bite out of my sandwich? Was it Mr. Nobody then? Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. So I, I get that, and I don't think I should necessarily have ascribed the fear to it I did when I heard about it in this story, but uh, still it did. It was weird. I hadn't thought about Mr. Nobody in a while, so anyway. Yeah, well, again, it sounds like a Stephen King novel. Yeah. I know it's Mr. Mercedes is out now, but uh, Mr. Nobody just sounds uh, perfect for that. Yeah. Yeah. This Mr. Nobody, Fred, has gotten extremely irritated about the exorcism, to force point that he just made, something about invoking religion 
not only did it not work, but it pissed him off. Well, he's a staunch atheist. So, yeah, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> didn't like to hear talk. Didn't have to hear a bunch of religious talk. Yeah. So this next series of events, for me, was one of the creepiest things that's ever happened in the house. Uh, Diane, the daughter, who seems to be the focus of a lot of things, but she's not always there. I just want to make this clear when things happen. In fact, the whole first round of events, she was not even home. It was just Philip and his grandmother. But in this case, Diane is downstairs in the house and there's a brass crucifix in the uh, lounge, I believe it's in. It flies across the room and sticks to her back. Now, and when I say sticks to her back, Colin Wilson describes it as a magnet. Yeah. It's stuck on her back. She's yelling, get it off me, get it off me. She can't get it. She can't even see what it is. She has to go look in a mirror in the kitchen. She's like looking behind her. She's like, what is it, what is it? And she can see this cross stuck to her back. Right. I imagine the action much like that fried egg that stuck to Mr. Spock's back in uh, the original Star Trek. Yes, yeah. They had to peel it off with acrylic tongs. Yes, I remember that. So she's got this thing stuck on her back. Then she goes running down the hall and they hear this crashing sound, a small crashing sound, and it's a picture of Jesus that has fallen off the wall. Also, there is another cross in the room and it falls down too. So we've got this cross stuck to her back. We've got the picture of Jesus falling off the wall, and they cannot seem to get it off of her. Now, eventually, it relaxes and it comes free, and there's no marks. She's not bruised or anything. So it's not really clear what's happening there. But just the idea of that, this thing on your back, you can't get to it. You can't get it removed. Her mom was trying to pull it off and couldn't. That is the beginning of the escalation. And this is just step one. Then on Easter Sunday... Jean smells the perfume smell again, and she knows something is about to happen. She comes down into the house, and she notices that someone or something has sprayed inverted crosses on the backs of all the doors in the house. Now, here's the thing about this that's fascinating. It's with gold paint, and she knows that there's gold paint in the house because they got it so that Philip could spray paint his bike. He wanted to paint his bike. Right, right. So she knows where the gold paint is. She goes out and finds it, and it's still there, right where it's supposed to be. I can't remember. It's in like the storage area or whatever. She brings it in, and she looks at these crosses, and it's like they were professionally done. It's the gold paint for sure, but it's almost as though they were stenciled. Yeah, that was the description, like they were stenciled or done by a professional sign painter. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just expert crisp edges. Right. She's got a, an investigative mind about how this stuff is happening. Maybe someone in my family is doing this or somebody. So she takes one of the cans and she spray paints the door in a different spot. And the paint won't even stick really because the door is glossy. Yeah. It just beads up and runs. Yes. Which there were no runny marks from the crosses. (laughs) So there's a whole thing there where the execution of this vandalism is so perfect. And, you know, it's an easy thing to hoax. I'm going to spray paint this or whatever. Maybe somebody came through and hoaxed it with a stencil or whatever. And while they were all sleeping... But there were no remnants of the paint as a result of that. There was no evidence that it had been done by a human being. So in addition to being perfect, it also seemed like something that she couldn't reproduce. So what's your evaluation of this thing happening on uh, one of the holiest days, maybe the holiest day, probably the holiest day in uh, Christendom, Easter, Sunday? Well, this tells me a lot. And it's another one of the things about my viewpoints and how they're changing since we started the show. And this is something that I always felt because Mm -hmm. I suppose, you know, four or five years ago, I was way more agnostic than I am now. Yes, you were. And I would say that my agnosticism was rooted in, I I always had a belief in a... A spiritual realm? Yeah, I was kind of from the school of Lucas with the force. I was like, (laughs) that's where I was at. It's gotten more specific for me as we've covered so many topics. Right. I've come to a point where I have learned to believe in good Mm -hmm. and probably more in religion because I absolutely believe in evil based Mm. on what we have learned doing this show. Right. So for me, it's a yin and yang situation. I can't believe in the evil and not believe in the good. Mm -hmm. So when I see a situation like this, And maybe this whole story is a hoax. Maybe it's all made up. But there's a lot of witnesses, and Colin talked to a lot of people when he did his coverage on this. Mm -hmm. 
And there's never been a mention of it being a hoax, aside from, you know, Aunt Maud thought it was the kids. But he interviewed Aunt Maud about the floating gloves. Mm -hmm. She was the skeptic. She would have told him if that was not what she had seen. Right. So I guess for me, this evokes that question. Whatever this thing is, it became irritated by the attempted exorcism. And it took its revenge out primarily on Diane right? in a specifically blasphemous way. That's a good point. It's targeting right. their belief in religion, yeah, and it's mocking it. In a less jokey way. Yeah, and I'm saying mocking, yes, and in a, not in a, in a, in a dis, way. Yeah, in a more disrespectful way. To me, the crucifix flying and sticking to her back is kind of like, oh, you like this so much? Here, I, I've stuck it to your back. Kind of yeah. a, it's somebody... It's like smashing an ice cream cone in someone's face, kind of like, you yeah. know what I'm saying? They're literally rubbing you with this thing that uh, you hold so dear. Yeah, it's a mocking, but it's like, that's not the tone of Fred from the past. You know, Fred from the past might do something silly, you know, melt the chocolate bunny all over the floor. Well, this evokes a question that we'll go into more depth on in part three when we start to analyze this haunting or this poltergeist. For me, there's a question of more than one presence being involved in this situation. Because you're right, it goes from comic to dark very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And since there's no way for us to really know, if you believe any of this at all, mm -hmm. if there's no way for us to really know what these people are dealing with, what this family is dealing with here, we don't have a way of knowing whether it's more than one thing. And that there might be different things with different dispositions. Yeah, it's just, to me, the logic of it, if there is any in this, is that this thing has a personality, and again, it's capricious. It's temperamental. It's got a childish sense of humor, but it gets angry, and imagine that anger mixed with just high intelligence, but also viciousness. Well, so you're saying it is counterpoint to the point I just made, is that maybe it is just one thing. And well, it's, it's, uh, it's been pushed too far. I think there's a lot going on at this house. Different, let's say, forces, if you will. Again, taking all these accounts as to be accurate, not saying unbelievable, but accurate as the descriptions are of the events, then the types of events and actions described take a lot of power. And so, again, from what I've read at one location, there could be several things going on, possibly one thing controlling other things, other spirits. And so... Uh, <laughs> Something like this, the dominant one, obviously there's something dark here as well. There's something playful. Again, it could be different things acting out different parts of this kind of personality, you know what I'm saying, that we've taken to be one thing. Or it could be one thing. I, You know, who knows? We will get into the analysis later of people who, again, are sensitive to this kind of thing, who think that there are several things going on. I personally don't know now, other than I can see this as something that is... Got a lot of different signs to its personality, and they're not all good. All right. These stories continue to escalate. We go now from the story of the crucifix to the story of the keys. And this is particularly interesting to me. Jean, there's a fireplace in the kitchen, apparently, and she needs to clean the flue. So she's leaning in there to clean the flue, reaching up, and all these objects start raining down on her, some even hitting her in the head. She pulls her head back. She looks down, and now in the bottom of the fireplace... There are a bunch of keys. She gets them all out. She picks them up. She counts them. There's 19 of them, and they're all keys to the house. It's every key in the house. Hmm. Then, And they've all been missing. And she looks at all these keys, and she's trying to figure out how they got up into the chimney and where they were up there. You know, maybe they were on top of the flue. Who knows? Maybe one of the kids put them there, if it's a hoax. However... There's one key that she does not recognize, and it's a particularly old-looking key, and she has no idea what it goes to. And the family kept it. And I guess, theoretically, they still have it. The Pritchard family still has this mm. key. They never figured out what it went to. That's pretty interesting to me. And the collection of the keys, that's really... I'm not sure what's going on there. If it's another just trickster thing, hey, this is a funny prank. I'm going to take the keys, you know, and <laughs> hide them in the sure. fireplace. Yeah. Or is there a message? in this. Well, this thing Especially hold, with the extra yeah. weird key that predated all the others. Two thoughts. One, I think you're right. It's literally a message. I hold all the keys and I can do with them as I please. Didn't mean to oh, accidentally nice little... make poetry there. Oh. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the idea though is that it's a prank. 
that's the second part of this is that it's a message. It's also another prank. It's something weird, but it's also maybe a clue as item number three here to my thinking on this. I so desperately want to know what that key opens. Where did it come from? The other thing that you hear about uh, is the materialization of matter spontaneously. I haven't done a lot of research on this, but from what I've read about exorcisms, some clergy and some witnesses report that the person affected, afflicted, will spit nails. So if that's true, and that's reported correctly, where are those nails coming from? It's not Home Depot. These are like vintage, the old fashioned kind of nails. And what's the message there? I think it's to mock the crucifixion of Christ. But where'd they get the metal? Where'd the metal come from? Who designed them? I believe I've seen a few photos of these. I don't know if that's real. I can't confirm that. But they're not the three penny nail you see at the hardware store. That's my point. It's not new stuff. And not to say that that gives it validity because these are old fashioned nails. I'm just saying if they materialized, where did that come from? That's interesting. So with these keys, to be clear, these are all keys that the family had on their key rings. They are just now all scooped up by Fred and dropped down the chimney. Yeah, and it, I mean, I, it's not clear whether they were floating in the chimney. I don't know, yeah. Or they were, know. because Colin Wilson doesn't go into this, whether right. or not she actually manipulated the flu. I would think that the flu is generally open because she's probably using that fireplace. Yeah, probably, yeah I would a good say deal. so. Um, right. uh, if you're so, but I mean, but maybe she reached up and opened the flu and that's when the keys oh, fell the key, out. I see what you're saying, yes. We yeah. don't really know that and he's nonspecific about it. So yeah. I can't say for sure, but... A long ways to go again for a joke and kind of sneaky to go around the house and collect everyone's keys without them noticing. Well, in addition to that, the chimney. in addition to that, from a hoaxing standpoint, yeah. if they were just resting on the top of the flu... I don't know how you'd get them on the top of the flue because the flue would have to be closed to hold the keys. Yes. Right. So I don't know how you would do that. Now, (laughs) right. And now if this was a movie, I mean, there was a movie made based on this. Yes, we're going to talk about that in part three. We're going to talk about that later. If this were a scene in a movie... Of course, that key would open a secret door, yes. which would, uh, you know, that would be the, have some, the uh, answer. Bones that yes, there need somebody, to be properly interred. Absolutely. Somebody needs to be found. That's the message. So you're, or there's something there that needs to be discovered. That's what that extra key was. But man, I just want to look at it because I don't know where it's from. Again, it could be stolen from somewhere else. Was it Yeah, made? there's no picture of it in the book yeah. either. I was disappointed that there weren't pictures. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, some people would, might say like, well, there you go, because it doesn't exist. Yeah. There's no key. Well, I mean, I feel like it was described in the other book I read, which again, we'll talk about in part three, yeah. as like a skeleton key. like Old a, fashioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the description I'd, I'd read. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, it's fascinating. We can't really point to an answer as to why it happened. You know, I've had a chance to use my Quip electric toothbrush for a while now, and I noticed I hadn't used my old manual toothbrush since then. There's no going back now. Manual toothbrush. (laughs) It just seems so old-fashioned to say. Well, what did you do with your old one? I use it to clean small machine parts and my grout. Okay, that yeah, that sounds like forest. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the Quip is so portable, and it goes wherever your teeth go. So, you know, like if I had a social function to go to right after work, I'd brush my teeth in the bathroom using one of those crummy travel brushes. But the Quip is so sleek and comes with its own travel cover, which also functions as a holder that sticks to any smooth surface. It's perfect for a brush up on the go. Yeah, let's get some James Bond action there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's kind of cool. <laughs> uh, so you're one of those guys. Hey. I <laughs> know. Uh, it's actually good oral and social health practice. And you're right. The Quip is a good traveler and it's streamlined because it runs off just one AAA battery, delivering gentle cleaning vibrations for the dentist recommended amount of time of two minutes. And even has a built-in timer that reminds you when to switch sides. Even if the battery dies while you're in the field, mm. it just turns into a well-designed toothbrush. <laughs> well, that does remind me of that Mitch Hedberg joke. I like escalators because they can never break. They can only become stairs. <laughs> well, I, I guess they could wear out. But when your Quip brush head wears out, they have an optional plan where they send you new brush heads on the dentist recommended schedule of every three months for just $5. And shipping is free worldwide. It's not just convenient, it's healthy. Quip starts at just $25, which is a fraction of the price of those bulkier, expensive electric toothbrushes. It was named one of Time Magazine's best inventions. And Quip is the first subscription electric toothbrush accepted by the American Dental Association. Hundreds of thousands of happy brushers are using Quip every day. So here's a great deal on how you can start brushing better and easier. Quip starts at just $25, and if you go to get 
Equip.com slash legends right now. You'll get your first refill pack free with a Quip electric toothbrush. That's your first refill pack free at getquip.com slash legends. Yeah, it's spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash legends. You know, one thing I've been pondering while watching our latest lecture at the Great Courses Plus Ancient Mesopotamia, Life in the Cradle of Civilization, is something Dr. Padani mentioned. If you count the lives of just 55 people who lived to be about 100, placing them end to end, it stretches back to the time of the first cities in Mesopotamia. And the first great city was Uruk, which is why it's called the Uruk period from about 3800 to 3100 BCE, right when urban civilization was just getting started and writing was invented. So what have you learned about Uruk so far? Well, scholars think that by about 3500 BCE, it was the biggest city in the world. The inhabitants had built a huge brick wall around it that enclosed around 642 acres. So it was like the size of a big university campus. That doesn't sound like much these days, but for its time, it was huge. Go on. It's estimated that as many as 25,000 people lived in the city, and although their lives weren't all that much different from ours now, most of their jobs would be. The whole economy of Uruk was based on farming. Yeah, that is kind of the opposite nowadays. But their invention of the plow was groundbreaking. Skidoomch. <laughs> Seriously, plows and better canals increased everything, and also the invention of the wheel. Like we've said before, a lot of people assume cavemen invented the wheel, but there's a theory that the Uruk pottery wheel may have been invented before the actual conveyance wheel, allowing them to mass produce pottery. Yeah, I know the wheel seems like an obvious first invention, but think about it. Whole civilizations around the world have developed and thrived without ever having the wheel. Well, we do love to talk about wheels around here, especially vehicular, and we also love our Great Courses Plus subscription, and we know you will too. And this is a great course to get started with. So here's a great deal to check out this or any one of thousands of lectures on a huge array of topics with this special limited time offer for Astonishing Legends listeners. A full month of unlimited access for free to watch anything over there. But you must sign up through our special URL, which is thegreatcoursesplus.com slash legends. That's right. Sign up today and get your free month of unlimited access by going to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash legends. Hi, I'm Craig from Scotland, and you're listening to Astonishing Legends with Scott Philbrook and Forrest Burgess. Now back to the show. Okay, this was a groundbreaking moment in the story of the Black Monk of Pontefract. This is when we're going to get a little bit of a sense of identity for the first time. As we mentioned in part one of the show, and, and I can't remember if we may have mentioned it tonight as well, the house at 30 East Drive, the council house, shares a common wall with a neighbor, just one wall with a next door neighbor. That wall, you may remember when the kitchen cabinets were initially having all those crazy vibrations, we explained to you that that wall was not connected to the other side. And in fact, they went to ask the neighbor about it. And she said, I thought you were doing something crazy over there. Well, Finally, they decide that they need to go talk to the neighbor and see if any of the events that are happening for them are permeating the wall, happening on the other side of the unit, on the other side of this common wall. So the woman that lives next door, her name is Mrs. Mountain. So they go over to see Mrs. Mountain, and they ask her, look, you know, we know what's going on. We have, we're having these problems, and uh, we know that you've heard some things, too, have you ever seen anything? And Mrs. Mountain says, well, you know, it's funny you should ask that. One morning, I was at my kitchen sink, and I felt something behind me. You know what I thought? I thought it was my nephew trying to sneak up and scare me. In fact, I said, oh, give over, which I imagine is an English expression <laughs> for, you know, give it up, I know it's you. But she said, when she turned around, she was face to face with a very tall being wearing a black monk's habit with a large hood over its head. And it was standing in such a way that she couldn't see its face. She couldn't see really if it even had a face. She said she stood staring at it for a few minutes. And weirdly, she said she felt no fear. She was not afraid. 
she just had an overwhelming sense of curiosity and then it disappeared. So that right there, I think, reinforces this idea that it's a monk. And this is the first time, really, that we're seeing this thing, this being that looks like a monk. And that's when it becomes the black monk of Pontefract, is with this sighting. Now, what's interesting to me about it, because in the story before, they didn't really address that. They called it Fred, they called it Mr. Nobody, but now this woman is describing not just a monk, but a very large being, presumably a man, I guess, yeah. if it's human at all, that looks like a monk. Now, Mrs. Mountain said she wasn't frightened of it for That's whatever interesting. reason. That's interesting. Well, yeah, you know, people react differently. Some people uh, don't react to jump scares. Some people don't. It doesn't bother them. Some people are okay with the idea of a supernatural world. I don't know how Mrs. Mountain felt about it, but again, that's something that's a spontaneous gut feeling, I think. You react in fear because something wants you to, even if you don't. Even if you're, I think, you're a seasoned ghost hunter, you still, the hair on the back of your neck stands up. You get that feeling in the pit of your stomach because you can't help it. You're still human. I had that feeling in a way that well, we'll talk, yeah, about, we'll right talk about it at Halloween. <laughs> well, I know. I saw yeah. I actually saw it once. I didn't see it this other time, but I saw it right afterwards. And uh, I will attest that it got my attention. So with Mrs. Mountain, what's interesting here, to be clear, I'm going to ask you here. This is the first time that an association of a monk in a robe, in a monk's robe, with a hood, with a cowl, has been made in this case. That's correct, right? That that's, is correct. That's what and, I thought. Yeah. And we talked very briefly about this in the cold open of part one. We mentioned the idea of this evil monk, in you know, air quotes, yeah. who had been convicted of assaulting and molesting a young girl. And, or, or multiples. Yeah, probably multiples. And ultimately was hanged right. on a gallows that supposedly stood just outside the front door of 30 East Drive. And there's been a researcher who did supposedly did research on this. We're going to talk more about this in part three when we're talking about what this could be. and yeah, analyzation of the reality of it The reality of, the of it story. All. Yeah, yeah, the reality of it. But, but that's that one connection. idea yeah. that came along after this sighting because, oh, well, she saw a monk, so let's look at monks. Let's see what's happened. And so mm -hmm. they thought maybe it was a Cluniac monk, according to this one researcher who said, was tried, convicted, and executed by hanging for attacking children. Mm -hmm. That's a real question here. But again, Mrs. Mountain wasn't afraid of this thing. That speaks volumes to me because when something, in my opinion, that has evolved so much in the past four years, mm -hmm. when something like that appears in front of you, you're going to feel exactly how it wants you to feel. And this thing, whatever it was, clearly didn't want her to be afraid because she wasn't. It's very neutral in that sense. Yeah. And uh, again, there's a lot of clues leading to nothing here. What's interesting is that, is that the same thing? We, you just don't know. I think if you're looking for an answer from that side of the veil, like it or not, it's somebody who's going to have psychic abilities, who does this kind of thing and gets impressions or a medium, somebody who is an empath, you know, and if you don't believe in any of that, none of the, <laughs> none of their answers are going to matter or make any sense to you anyway. But if you do, then I think that's the only arena, the only source where we're going to get some kind of insight into this. And we may have a little bit in this case, but in this instance, I believe that it's an image, but you can't tell what it is of. It is this thing projecting this because it just likes the look of a monk's robe. It's a very classic and iconic image. We talked about this in Shadow People. People always say like, well, that's an internet sensation. It's like, no, back in the day, these things were called shadow monks or black monks or this and that. And it doesn't ha necessarily have to do with the habit. There was a discussion on, uh, on Facebook about possibly being, you know, different orders, having different colors. We talked about that at Grey Friars too. Franciscan monks, that's why they were called the Grey Friars. Their habit or cowl, I guess, was gray in color. That may not have anything to do with it. It's a shadow. As you look at one of the photos from the website that we've shared on our website as well, there is an image on the stairs, which is not in any shape of any person, but it's somewhat human-like, and it's just a, a blacker-than-black cloud, mist, with no definition on the stairs. Like somebody had basically, in the if it was an old-fashioned chemical photograph, 
had dodged that area so that uh, it's just black with fuzzy edges to it. And so, you know, I think in this case, we don't know what this is because it didn't really say anything to Mrs. Mountain, didn't have any statement. No, and also this could be one of those things that's more like an echo of some kind, like our friend Marty saw in the Queen Mary. Yeah, that's true. That's not interactive because it's not aware it's there because there's nothing attached to it other than it's a reflection of something that has come and gone. That is a great point, and maybe why there wasn't any emotional, physical sensation, because it was a visual echo of some kind. Marty, I know, our friend on the Queen Mary, well, he had one, it wasn't like the pit of your stomach fear. I think it was just like, what is this standing behind what me in the I mirror? What am I seeing? Yeah. Because again, being a close friend, I've asked him about this a lot. And it's like, he said, I could feel my neck muscles starting to tense up and cramp because I was like, I got to look at this as much and as long as possible <laughs> as I can, because as soon as I turn my head, it's going to go away. So it was intense... I guess shock. There's a little bit of fear there, of course, because there's a dude in your room that should only contain you and your wife, and he's getting ready, and that shouldn't be happening. That should not be happening. There's a lot going on there, but it wasn't like abject terror, like some people report with shadow people during the night waking them up. This case, it's like, it's just an image. So it's curious. As we go to investigate whether the Cluniac monks, how much activity they had on the grounds, you know, what the influences of that order on this location, you wonder if it's just an image, an echo of just a, a regular monk, nice guy, <laughs> just wandering around. It just happens to be reflecting back at this point in time. Or is it something that, you know, one of these entities in this house is trying to project as subterfuge, as a reference of like, well, if you want to go off and get crazy about this, maybe this is what I look like. Maybe I don't. Again, this thing's a trickster. Uh, yeah, but it's know. showing it. Why is it showing itself to the neighbor? I mean, well, that's okay. You don't know, you they don't may know have... this is a true image. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like the uh, if I was goofing around and depending on the person I was pranking as a spirit, I would show up as a man in black. Yeah. Because this guy's really into UFOs. This is going to freak his stuff. You know, like it's that old adage from the horror movies. It knows what scares you and uh, projects that back to you. In this case, she's not scared of it. It's just, I think she's just viewing it. She's just well, taking in the information. But I guess my point here is, I don't know what this is, but shadow sounds interesting to me, visual echo, something that happens and has uh, been reported and documented. There's all kinds of photos. There, there's one that's kind of innocuous. I passed it around to our group of friends here, with you and Marty, another friend of ours, and it's somebody taking a photo of a dance recital. And I think it's all, you know, a bunch of grade school girls on the stage and off to one side of the stage, there's a, it looks like an older woman, probably in her mid-20s to early 30s, doing a spin. She's wearing, uh, you know, the dance skin uh, leotard there with the dance skirt, and she's kind of mid-twirl. You see her, that motion. But her legs fade away. There's no legs there. So is that a ghost, or is that an echo of something, you know, that place being a theater for so many years, just repeating? Mm-hmm. And not to say that person's even dead and it's a spirit. You know what I'm saying? It's like, who knows what that is? The photo looks to be authentic. It's such a weird thing to prank if it was a little girl's dance recital. It's just, that's a strange photo to prank in and of itself. But here is, yeah, I, this instance here, like you said, Scott, is really fascinating because it's the first time you get a definitive image of something we can identify. And it also gives this story a name. Well, all of these events are now leading up to the final assault. And we talked a lot about how this thing didn't seem to want to really actually physically hurt Diane. But we also talked about how things got ramped up and we're going to ramp up in tonight's episode. And this last story is the one that's going to make it clear that not only can it hurt people, but it does. So we're going to be talking about what happened here. It's going to be the last story of the night before we end the show. And Forrest, I don't know, since we're not going to come back after this without giving it away, is there anything you want to say about this event mm. uh, before we break into reading it here? I think once you get done hearing this story, you'll notice that it does fit some of the legendary aspects of this story about monks and, uh, you know, the medieval monk story, the condemned man the vengeful spirit and all that, it fits that. But is it that thing? Is it something else? 
is it just an evil demon looking to hide under a story to conceal its identity? Well, with that, I'm going to actually read this one straight from Colin's book. So once again, last citation here. This is Colin Wilson's book, Poltergeist, a classic study in destructive hauntings. And this particular passage is from the Kindle locations of 2030 to 2035. The phenomena reached a kind of climax one evening when Diane had gone to the kitchen to make coffee. The lights went out, and while Jean Pritchard was groping for the torch, she heard Diane scream. It was dusk, and there was, in fact, enough light to be able to see their way around the house. They found that Diane was being dragged up the stairs, and it was light enough to see that her cardigan was stretched out in front of her as if Fred was tugging at it. His other hand was apparently on her throat. Philip and Jean Pritchard rushed up the stairs and began trying to pull Diane down again. She was yelling with terror. This was the first time it had laid hands on her. Philip and Jean Pritchard went tumbling backwards down the stairs with Diane. Philip has the impression that it was his thought of trying to touch the presence that caused it to let go. He made the interesting comment, it always seemed to be ahead of you. Diane had to be given a large brandy. In the light, they saw that her throat was covered with red finger marks. That's going to wrap up part two of our show on the Black Monk of Pontefract. We'll be back next week with our third and final part, which will look at recent investigations and have our analysis of this case. Please remember to support our sponsors. They keep the show free and the lights on in Blanket Fortiana. Special thanks to John Bolin. Hi, I'm Luke Carruthers. Hi, I'm Marty. Hi, I'm Craig from Scotland. And I give permission to perpetuity. However they say fit. I promise, galaxy-wide, my last name is... Cano. C-A-N-O. No B. Our show is edited by Sarah Wendell. And our theme, which is available as a ringtone, is by Judson Crane. Sound design is by Ryan McCullough. Special thanks to The Ark and its lead researcher, Tess Feifel. But most importantly, we want to thank you, our listeners. Visit our store at AstonishingLegends.com or interact with us and other listeners on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also find us at Patreon.com slash AstonishingLegends if you'd like to support the show in that way. Copyright Astonishing Legends Productions. Good night.